So welcome to the first colloquium of the um, spring semester. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Sandra Vanderlinden. Sandra is currently a postdoctoral research associate and lecturer in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. He's also director of the Social and Environmental Decision-Making Lab at Princeton and has been a research affiliate in the past and visiting research scholar at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Sandra received his PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science. His research interests include judgment and decision-making, social influence processes and public risk perception, and science communication. He's especially interested in applying insights from behavioral and psychological science to public policy and communication issues. The title of today's talk, if it hasn't changed, is The Psychology of Consensus, How Communicating Normative Agreement Influences Decision-Making About Science, Health, and the Environment. So please join me in welcoming Sandra Vanderlei. First off, thanks so much for uh, having me today. Delighted to be here at the Annenberg School, and particularly this wonderful room you guys have. Um, and um, so I'll jump right in. So when I talk about consensus, um, I'm really talking about describing uh, a state of, of normative agreement. And in one hand, we can think of that as a descriptive norm, sort of in the sense that Bob Cialdini and colleagues use it, um, the number of experts or doctors or friends that agree on, on issues of importance. Um, on the other hand, the way that my thinking evolved about consensus is that in many ways it really transcends the idea of a social norm in that we can think about other forms of consensus, moral consensus, the extent to which we agree on standards of what we view as right or wrong, uh, political consensus, and in fact it's often consensus that underlies other types of social influence processes. For example, um, as a group, we can decide on what the norm in a particular situation should be, uh, which then has its own normative influence, but it's somewhat distinct from the psychology of consensus. Um, and in fact, in, at least in social psychology, we make a distinction between consensus and conformity in a sense that they're related, but, but not the same thing. So we can talk about, for example, Ash's classic uh, line experiment, where he shows people a line and basically asks, people to match it to one of three other lines. And he had people paired up in a, in a row, and everyone except the last person was instructed to give the wrong answer. Uh, and he wondered if that group consensus can induce conformity with the consensus. And then he found that it, that it did, in fact. And more importantly, that when people start to dissent from the consensus, that undermines uh, conformity pretty quickly. And so consensus is really the more fundamental normative process that influences many other types of social influence situations. And I think that this is sort of a, a different perspective that has uh, interested me particularly, also from the perspective that consensus decision-making strategies are really at the heart of the evolution of uh, human cooperation. When you think about how groups had to make decisions and reach a consensus on a particular course of action, um, they had to form consensus both within as well as between groups in terms of explaining large-scale human coordination. And in fact, uh, Conrad and Roper, they did this review article talking about how prevalent consensus decision-making is not only for humans but throughout the animal kingdom. And they really say society wouldn't function uh, without the idea of consensus, uh, which I thought was an interesting statement. My interest really comes from the idea that people seem to use consensus and normative agreement as an influential judgment heuristic, uh, particularly in terms of how it influences their decisions. And the most simple and mundane uh, explanation I have for that, and one of my favorite examples, is the shredded weed box. Um, and here you clearly see that companies have been onto this idea for a long time, uh, perhaps not scientifically, but they seem to understand that this influences people on some level, right? Nine out of 10 doctors recommend this product. People walk around in the supermarket and they see consensus is high that this is good for my health, so I'm gonna use that um, as an inference for whether or not I'm ultimately going to buy this, um, this product. And the same goes for toothpaste, right? Nine out of 10 dentists uh, agree. And you see consensus, especially in the new media environment, is really everywhere, from social media impressions to Yelp ratings to movie ratings. We see consensus everywhere, and I'm fascinated by how it influences, how this communication of consensus influences us. Um, particularly here, I'm combining the literature on expert credibility heuristics and heuristic decision-making with social influence in the sense that we're describing a norm among a particular group of people from which we tend to take cues in, in certain situations. And that's sort of how I arrived at uh, this particular topic. 
And I'll end with the idea that from a decision-making perspective, um, it's not always adaptive to heuristically follow norms, but there's a good case to be made that expert consensus is actually an interesting case to consider because it's what we call an ecologically rational decision heuristic. What I mean by that is that people tend to think heuristics are bad, but heuristics evolved, um, human reliance on heuristics evolved for a specific uh, purpose because the structure of the decision-making environment is often such that we deal with a high amount of complexity, a lot of uncertainty, and limited time to make decisions. So we have to make strategic bets on what the best decision in a given situation is going to be. And when we talk about expert consensus, we're really talking not only about a simple normative fact that people can relate to, but what it implicitly embodies, right? It's a rich amount of information that cuts right through the heart of the, the matter. And so heuristics are computationally efficient when we sort of simulate how decision strategies work. Um, um, you can find that on average, heuristics might do better than more complex models. And just to give you an example of the context of climate change, we could all get, uh, try to get a PhD in atmospheric uh, science, try to assess the climatological record, sort of study whether or not climate change is happening, uh, which might be a noble objective in itself, but by the time we've all independently done that, uh, it might be too late in terms of doing anything about it, right? So in an uncertain world, uh, relying on heuristics can actually be adaptive and, and a sensible thing to do. My interest in climate change really grew out of this notion that I can't think of a more psychologically diverse and unique communication challenge than the issue of climate change. You know, it's not only one of the foremost, perhaps it is the foremost societal challenge that we're currently um, facing. And especially when you compare it to other types of risks, like health risks, it's very impersonal to people, the issue of climate change, right? It tends to be psychologically distant, so people tend to, both temporally as well as spatially, so people tend to think it's happening in other countries to other people um, at some other point in time. It's a massive social dilemma. In a sense, we have to sacrifice something now for uncertain future gains. There's huge political polarization on the issue. And so thinking about how can we communicate anything that resonates with, uh, with people on some of these issues is, is what motivated me. And we recently did a uh, a piece for Perspectives on Psych Science, kind of summarizing the psychology of climate change communication and everything we know um, about this so far and some, some concrete recommendations for, um, for policy making. I'm also working on an Oxford Encyclopedia uh, entry on the psychology of climate change communication, and I continue to think that it's an incredibly important topic. I'd love to show this, this chart um, or, or bar graph between, this is from Pew, um, that illustrates the difference between what the public thinks and what scientists think. And so here, you see on basic scientific principles, like evolution, only 65% of Americans believe in, in evolution. I think that's quite, quite stunning to, to, to even ponder that. Uh, but it's even, it's even more pronounced for, for climate change, right? Only 50% of the American public endorses human causation of, of climate change. And of course, when you break this down by ideology, you see a huge polarization where most Democrats support the, this statement, but less than a third of Republicans. And in fact, I borrowed this chart from Riley Dunlap and, and Aaron McWright, who've shown that these are voting records for Democrats and Republicans since the 70s on environmental protection issues in the United States. And since the 1970s, uh, they've been growing further and further apart. This is a graph of my colleagues at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, showing that on average, only one out of 10 Americans understand that there's a near unanimous consensus among scientists on the issue of climate change. Most people don't know that there is a consensus, have never heard of it, or for other reasons uh, um, don't seem to report on it. And so you might ask, okay, so why is this important? What's interesting about communicating this level of normative agreement among scientists uh, on this particular issue? And so what I hope to share with you today, that not just on the issue of climate change, but across domains, that there's something interesting and unique about communicating consensus. The first is that perceptions of normative agreement seem to function as a as a gateway to other central beliefs that people hold with regard to these issues. So it's really centrally located, and it has these cascading influences on things that are crucial in determining our opinion formation uh, and attitude formation on some of these issues. The second is that often when we talk about corrective information or trying to correct misperceptions people have, is that we tend to give people an article that illustrates why the myth isn't true, and then here's what you should believe, or here's the correction. What what we know from cognitive psychology, what that tends to do is it tends to reinforce the uh, memory networks that people have associated with the misinformation and because it takes more cognitive effort to adjust our beliefs away from, the, from that position, people just tend to end up 
um, believing the myth more so than they did before. And so I'll show you that consensus can actually change misperceptions <coughs> without having to use any type of misinformation or repeating it at all. The third and perhaps the most talked about interesting property is that group consensus messaging can neutralize motivated reasoning and political attitude polarization in, in this context. And as I hope to show you, or at least what I tried to show before, is that this is a big issue on, uh, on, on some of these issues, so it's an important quality to have. So I'll jump in on the first study that I'd like to show you, where basically we were thinking about how to even communicate the issue of the scientific consensus on, on climate change. And what we did, basically, using a nationally representative sample, um, we did an online survey experiment where we were interested in testing what's a good way to communicate this to people, and does communicating this to people even work in terms of do people change their perceptions? So we did a mixed design experiment where we both had a between a treatment and a control group as well as a pre and a post measure uh, to look at some of these differences. The pre and the post were in the same survey, but we tried to distract people as much as we could in terms of the, uh, the treatment exposure. So basically we asked people to estimate what they think the consensus is concretely. There are other ways to do this, but some of the research I work on in terms of verbal quantifiers of uncertainty uh, really show that, that using labels uh, is an uh, incredibly imprecise measure of, of what people think. Um, whether or not they believe in climate change, that it's human cost, how much they worry about it, and whether or not they support various measures for, for action on the issue. We had 11 conditions. Uh, this started out relatively uh, exploratory, where um, we were thinking about using metaphors, particularly because it's been used in climate communications before, because we're talking about complex issues like phenomena of stock and flow and accumulation. Metaphors tend to be helpful in, in um, making issues more concrete for people. So we thought maybe, maybe it will work here. Of course, we just had a standard scientific text, as well as a pie chart, because we know from cognitive psychology that people process proportions most efficiently uh, when viewed uh, as a pie chart. And the control was simply no, no information. Now, I'll show you the, the full design here, because we broke this out by a doctor metaphor, a bridge metaphor, the full metaphor, and just the text, because you know we wanted to know, is it the text or the picture, sort of all the common concerns. Um, as well as whether or not the metaphor should be more action or behavior inspired versus simply belief inspired. And I'll show you an example of some of the treatments we used. Here's the doctor metaphor. Right? If 97% of doctors concluded that your child is sick, would you believe them? 97% right? of climate scientists have concluded this. The idea is sort of drawing on the literature, literature of metaphors using a, a familiar target. Here, you know, something people can relate to in a novel domain uh, uh, tends, to, tends to work. And so the idea here, of course, is you trust consensus in one domain, why not in another domain? Here's the bridge metaphor, right? 97% of engineers concluded that a bridge is unsafe to cross. Would you cross it? Uh, this is sort of the action-based metaphor. The pie chart we used actually resembles one that is used in the media, sort of this Pac-Man uh, uh, pie chart, uh, simply because it, it has ecological validity in the sense that this is uh, where Obama tweets and, and, uh, and others talk about when they talk about the, uh, the scientific consensus. So this study was funded by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and we had to uh, systematically bias all of the messages with the, uh, with the logo um, that we displayed uh, right there. Fortunately, um, or I should say unfortunately, most people were completely unaware of what the AAAS um, is in terms of the, uh, the organization. So here are the results, the interesting part. What we found is that the metaphors really didn't differ uh, across the, the, the different contexts. And, and really, they were so homogenous that the effect sort of hovered around 11, 12 percent. So we sort of collapsed them together in one condition to reduce the, uh, the amount of comparisons. Not that that mattered for the, uh, the significance, but it's, it's just easier to view it this way. Uh, and you actually see that the descriptive text in the pie chart did better significantly than the metaphors. And this was sort of unexpected and an interesting question. But perhaps the more important takeaway is that all of the communications significantly change people's perception of the consensus. Um, I think that's the, that's the broader conclusion. Um, we also broke this down by ideology, because of course the big question to what extent these communications work for different audiences. And you see here that the messages actually worked um, about equally well for Republicans, independents, and, and Democrats. You could say that the effect was greater among Republicans, uh, which seems to be driven by the pie chart. Um, we didn't attach any particular significance to the pie chart, but as an interesting example of media influence, this is what happened. Um, how to convince a Republican to use a pie chart. Um, 
Clearly, that, that was not the, the takeaway of, uh, of the study, um, but, but I thought it's an interesting case of, of how the media influence takes its own spin on, uh, uh, on science communication as well. Okay, so the more interesting uh, question for me was something that we've termed the gateway belief model and, and sort of looking at how changing people's perception of the level of normative agreement among scientists influences other um, key beliefs. And this is sort of the model we developed and the idea that consensus messaging changes people's perception of the level of normative agreement, which then feeds into these key beliefs that people hold with regard to the issue, which in turn influence public action. We know that these are key beliefs from previous work where both sort of the cognitive belief-based as well as effective worry-based measures both sort of feed into uh, people's support. This was an index of, of, of support on the issue. Um, and the hypothesis was that these key beliefs mediate the change in perceived scientific agreement. So sort of that the main effects of the messages on, uh, uh, on other measures was mediated uh, by people's perception, uh, which then functions as a uh, the term, it's the use of the term gateway. And in fact, that's what we found. Here's the mediation model, a structural equation model, that essentially shows that if you were in one of the consensus treatment conditions versus in the control conditions, you significantly changed your perception of the level of scientific agreement on the issue, right, a quite big effect size, which then had cascading influences on people's key beliefs, whether or not they think it's happening, human caused, and how much they worry about the issue, which then in turn uh, predicts support for public action. There was a positive interaction here with ideology for Republicans, but I didn't think it, that was theoretically uh, significant enough to explicitly model. It also didn't improve the model fit, but it is something that we wanted to ultimately explore further. Um, this led to somewhat more reasonable headlines. Um, talking about motivated reasoning, um, you can think, well, maybe, maybe people that are exposed to this type of science information will just become more polarized after their exposure, right? Uh, sort of these, these uh, cultural wars between Republicans and, and Democrats. And this was really standing in, in contrast to what we find is that people come out less polarized after you ex uh, expose them to this message. And um, one of my colleagues and I, Steve Lewandowski, we sort of, we wrote an article on the psychology of consensus and, and, and this was a popular article, but we're basically, we're, we're talking about some ideas of why we think uh, there's some differences here. Right? We're, not, we're not communicating some type of knowledge that people can really debate in some sense. This is not a specific type of knowledge. It's a sort of social knowledge, um, which has a different influence on people. Um, the norm that we're talking about is also a nonpartisan norm, right? There's no reason why Republicans or liberals should greatly differ uh, with the extent to which they rely on, on experts uh, across domains. Of course, trust could be a, a mediating uh, issue here, but generally we find that there's something significantly different about communicating normative agreement uh, uh, that should not lead to, to motivated reasoning, at least not on average across the board. But it was reason enough to replicate um, some of this data. I'm a big fan of, of open data and replication science, and we did a, perhaps the biggest replication on this topic. We had a, another national sample of 6,000 um, people. And this time we balanced the treatment and control groups on a number of additional factors, uh, as well as we balanced the treatment and the control group so that they matched exactly in terms of their social demographic uh, uh, characteristics. Same design as the first study. I should tell you that in the first study, people didn't know what type of experiment they were participating in. Basically, we told people that it was a public opinion study about popular topics, and we had three blocks uh, randomized at the beginning where people answered questions about other topics as well. Uh, that, at, at that time in the news, was, um, there was something in the news about the level of um, raising the level for um, uh, uh, drunk driving, alcohol, blood level, uh, as well as Angelina Jolie's double mastectomy, and we had various uh, popular topics uh, that um, were randomly um, used in, in the experiment. In addition, after people, before people were shown the treatment, we basically told them that we have a large media database of topics and now they will be randomly shown. Uh, but of course, it was always climate change. Uh, but, but so we tried to hide the, the purpose of the experiment. Here we went uh, a step further. So we, we just used the simple consensus methods because we found that that um, works perfectly fine. Um, in some sense, it was interesting that people, we asked people later about what they thought about all the treatments, and it seems that people seem to think that the metaphors were emotionally compelling, but in fact, their memory recall of the information was much better in the other conditions. It seems that the metaphors might just be distracting people from a simple message 
um, like consensus. We try to include more distractions here to sort of uh, make it more realistic in the sense that, you know, people in the real world, there's all kinds of distracting information. And we ask people a bunch of questions about the new Star Wars movie and all of that. By the way, if you want to know what the consensus among the American public is on the greatest Star Wars movie of all time, uh, uh, I have the answer. Uh, we can talk about it uh, 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 later. Um, so briefly, just briefly, here's the results. Uh, again, we replicate this treatment effect exactly. The average treatment effect in our other experiment was 18%. Um, so the main effect here is almost identical for people's change in, in consensus. Breaking it down by um, political party gives the same result. Again, significantly higher for Republicans compared to Democrats and Independent, but it worked across the board. Just to show you, I'm not selectively using measures here. It's the same pattern for ideology. Um, and again, this gateway model replicate perfectly even a better fit to the data with a uh, larger sample. Um, I had additional questions when, I, when we were designing this study. For example, how does scientific consensus compare to social consensus or moral con consensus? People might be taking different cues from different people on some of these issues. And here's a receiver operating characteristic curve, which basically, in short, this uh, looks at how well one measure, in this case, classifies someone as either, as either active on the issue of climate change or disengaged. And I use an index of both behavioral as well as belief measures to sort of segment people into engaged versus not engaged. Uh, the line in the middle uh, there is the, the, what is called the line of no discrimination. So basically, if you would use one cue to predict whether or not people's position on the issue of climate change, uh, along that line would give you a 50-50% 50, 50, uh, chance above the line uh, significantly better. And actually, you see here what's really interesting. The red line is where we ask people, what do you think other Americans think um, about the issue of climate change? How, what percent of Americans do you think agree on this issue? Um, seems to be somewhat predictive, but not terribly, of people's position on the issue of climate change. Uh, interesting, the blue line is what people, important social reference think about the issue of climate change. So if your friends and family think that there's an urgent issue, of course you are highly likely to think it's an urgent issue as well. This is consistent sort of with the traditional social uh, norm literature. But what's notable is that there's no significant difference between the effect of scientific consensus and social consensus. So it seems that people rely just as much as on what scientists think on, on this issue than on what other people think. One big factor for us was, well, Maybe we're just communicating this information in an environment that's not exactly matched to reality, right? There's a lot of misinformation out there that influences people that we should probably consider. Um, of course, this is in tradition some, some of the great work done here at Annenberg on the echo chamber of conservative media. Um, this was a movie by, um, based on a book by Noam Uresky's Merchants of Doubt. It's a great movie. It talks about the tobacco industry, of course, again, which is a prominent topic here about how the tobacco industry has obscured the consensus on, on um, cancer and smoking for a long time and, and drawn parallels to what's happening in the context of climate change. Uh, very similar things are happening here. Um, uh, basically, same type of campaign. One factor that I've been interested in in terms of uh, media effects is conspiracy theories. Uh, I started out thinking about this uh, as a psychologist. I thought th about belief systems and how belief structures work in terms of influencing people's worldviews and, and their decision making. And a conspiracy theory is what we call a monological belief system in the sense that it's a self-reinforcing loop um, where people justify you know, any counter arguments you might have about inconsistencies with, with global, what we call global coherence. So, for example, if you would argue with someone that their conspiracy theory is false, they would say it's part of a larger conspiracy. And if you say that's false, then clearly you don't get it because it's, it's a global conspiracy. Um, and here I'm mainly talking about the media effect of what these type of conspiracy theories, the, the media influence of these type of conspiracies and how people talk about it uh, influences decision making. And it, basically I did an experiment on, on MTurk, uh, between subject experiment. Uh, one was a conspiracy theory condition where I exposed people to a real, I wanted to expose people to real information here. Uh, a movie, it's called the, the Great Global Warming Swindle, um, sort of starts out very dark. You're all being influenced by governments and scientists and sort of traditional uh, conspiracy uh, ideation. And then I had another condition. I thought, well, maybe we can move people with, uh, with a positive video from the UN uh, on climate change to sort of compare it against that, as well as a control 
condition that there was basically a neutral word puzzle. And here I was more interested in outcomes, not only if, if this type of misinformation undermines people's perception of the consensus, but also if it affects behavior in a sense that we ask people to sign a, a real uh, public global warming petition, as well as some intentions to, to be pro-social in general in terms of volunteering uh, in the next uh, six months as sort of a standard intention measure. Um, so the manipulation check was successful in the sense that, that you know, people exposed in the conspiracy conditions thought it was a hoax more so than people in the other conditions. Um, interestingly, this type of video, which wasn't a whole video, by the way, I just exposed people to a five-minute excerpt to, to sort of see if this kind of works as a contagion in the sense that being influenced by this type of thinking then sort of influences our, our decision-making. There was a significant effect. Uh, here you see that the estimate of consensus is almost 10 points lower in the conspiracy conditions. I would say that that's quite a big effect size compared to the other conditions. Um, here you see essentially people that signed the petition versus that didn't sign the petition um, by treatment group. And again, you see people in the conspiracy condition were almost 20% less likely than people in the pro condition to sign it, and also about 12% less likely than people in the control. And again, this was a significant effect on a, on a, on a civic behavior, essentially, uh, from just a single exposure. Uh, and there was even a marginal effect on, on pro-social intentions in that People in the conspiracy condition, on average, were compared to the combined uh, other conditions, were somewhat less likely to be pro-social because it just tends to put people in an antisocial mood when, when you're being suspicious about governments, NGOs, <laughs> scientists, the UN. Um, and so it's clear that uh, people don't process information in a vacuum, of course. We might process conflicting information about the world. Um, some information might be congruent what we already believe. Some information might contradict what we already believe. Uh, and so I wanted to improve sort of the ecological validity of, of our prior work on, um, on this and ask two main questions. One, does the presence of influential misinformation um, diminish the effect of communicating uh, consensus in this sense, which is a different question? And two, perhaps the more interesting question is here, can we inoculate people? If that is indeed the case, can we inoculate people against this sort of misinformation? And here we're loosely drawing on inoculation theory which of course is a big, uh, uh, was a big theory in the 60s in both social psychology uh, as well as communications. Uh, its effectiveness has been demonstrated in various domains, especially the public uh, 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 political campaigning domain. And the idea of inoculation theory is that it's supposed to strengthen people's existing attitudes by rendering them less susceptible to change. And it really has two components, an effective component which is where people are warned that their existing attitudes might be threatened, which is supposed to trigger motivation for people to protect their, their position, as well as what's called the refutational preemption phase, where people uh, basically counter-argue the, the argument. So the an analogy with the uh, 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 metaphor in terms of the, the medical metaphor is that you inject people with a weak version of the counter-argument let's say, uh, uh, equivalent to the virus, that then supposed to generate antibodies um, here, resistance to um, future attacks on one's attitude. So basically, I'm going to expose you to a weak version of what the opposite uh, party might say. Then I'm going to give you counter arguments so you can resist uh, that type of argumentation in the future. And through that process of counter arguing, you're building up resistance to, um, to attacks on, on your attitude. One question, however, that's not been asked about this type of research is that most of it has been performed on things that we call cultural truisms, uh, protecting people's attitude when we already have positive attitudes about things like brushing our teeth, uh, things that are, that are quite uh, obvious, and we simply want to protect those positive attitudes. But what about how does this work when people have pre-existing attitudes on controversial issues such as climate change, where people clearly have different pre-existing attitudes, right? There's a potential to backfire among audiences um, who don't believe in the issue. In fact, you can rethink the entire inoculation analogy here. Um, if you relate it back to medicine, if someone already has the virus and you give them the vaccine, you could probably potentially kill that person. Um, so is there a backfire effect? We thought that that was an interesting uh, question. So in the first study, we wanted to make sure that we give people misinformation that is actually valid in terms of the type of misinformation that people see on this topic. So we did a national probability sample, basically exposing people to all the common criticisms um, 
on, the, on uh, the issue of climate change. Right? The IPCC is an alarmist organization. Climate scientists are just doing this because um, that's how they get their money. Um, and then we looked at, well, what argument are people not only familiar with, the most familiar, but what argument do they also find the most convincing? And so we took the product of that in terms of ranking these various uh, arguments. And people seem to think uh, the, the conspiracy was, was also pretty high, but people seem to think that there is no consensus um, based on this um, website called the Oregon Petition. The Oregon Petition is a real petition, and this is, the, this is what we use as a treatment. This is the landing site of the website claiming that almost uh, over 31,000 American scientists have signed a petition saying that climate change is not happening, there's no consensus, uh, et cetera. And, this is from some obscure institution located on a farm somewhere in Oregon. Uh, but this is a, a real type of misinformation. And we sort of contrasted that against the simplest uh, consensus measures that, that we've used uh, so far. So we did a large study on MTurk this time, about two, a little over 2,000 people. And we had six conditions. The first one, again, I just wanted to replicate the effect of the consensus message. And then see if the counter information by itself uh, how much damage uh, that sort of does, and then pairing them against each other. Does one cancel the, the other out, sort of say? Uh, and uh, more interestingly, can we then inoculate people against the, uh, the misinformation? I use both a short, what I call short and a long inoculation, in the sense that um, the short inoculation basically tells people, you know, your attitude's about to be uh, uh, threatened, some groups will try to convince you otherwise, but you shouldn't believe them um, uh, because of this. My reasoning for this was it's costly. Every other sentence in a mass communication is, is costly, right? What's the marginal benefit of using one more sentence to try to convince people? Uh, and so I wanted to see if the longer message indeed pays off in terms of the, uh, the simple inoculation. As well as, of course, the, the standard control group. Uh, this is a study that, uh, that's currently in revision for nature, uh, uh, climate change. And I'll briefly show you the, the short inoculation uh, uh, here. We start with the consensus, essentially, and then we tell people some politically motivated groups that use misleading tactics to try to convince you um, that there is no consensus, but in fact there is a consensus, right, the, the sort of the short version. In the longer version, I'm not sure if you can read it here, we basically told people, well, listen, this petition includes, signees of this petition include members of the uh, Spice Girls, Charles Darwin, uh, this clearly is a bogus petition. Um, 30,000 is not even 0.3% of U.S. Uh, uh, graduates in science. In fact, almost none of the signatories uh, have a degree in climate science. Sort of the more traditional inoculation where you really try to debunk something in detail. My concern with scaling this type of thing was, well, you know, that, that takes a lot of effort. So if we could do it with fewer words, that would be advantageous. Um, Basically, our sample was, uh, this is compared to the national census data. It wasn't, it wasn't that much off on, on party affiliation and region and, and uh, uh, gender. It, it was a bit off on education. MTurk participants tend to be a bit higher educated. Um, so here are the results. Again, replicate that simple consensus effect. Seems to hover around 20%, which I think is a large, quite a large effect by itself. Then you see the second condition from the left I'm reading it from, uh, from left to right, um, is the misinformation by itself, right? Has a significant negative effect. Paired together, it seemed to cancel each other out. This is interesting in the sense that is consensus seems to neutralize misinformation or ne misinformation neutralizes uh, consensus. Um, and then the inoculations seem to preserve some of that initial effect. The short one uh, preserves about a third of the initial effect, whereas the longer one about two thirds, um, which, Contrary to my hypothesis, uh, more words seems to, seem to pay off, which seems logical in this sense because you're giving people much more uh, a, a richer cognitive repertoire to, to counter-argue uh, some of these uh, messages, of course. And in the control group, of course, there, there was no change. The interesting thing is breaking this down by ideology now and looking at, at when people have pre-existing attitudes towards this issue. Strikingly, you find this pattern almost across uh, all political groups, this exact pattern. Um, there, again, you see here for both Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, the large initial effect of the, the pie chart by itself, the negative effect for misinformation, uh, the inoculations, and the control group. There's one notable difference, that for Republicans, when you pair, this is the green bar, 
when you pair misinformation with the consensus message, it doesn't simply neutralize. Uh, they seem to uh, gravitate more towards the misinformation and that influences their opinion more so than the rest. And you would expect this in the sense that if your pre-existing beliefs are more aligned with one type of information than another, then according to the you know, literature and confirmation bias, we expect you to gravitate uh, uh, much more towards uh, taking cues from that type of misinformation. However, what's important to take away from this is that if there wasn't a consensus message presence, the effect would be worse, all right? And so it certainly doesn't increase polarization uh, uh, of any kind. It seems to move most people uh, on the issue. And I think that's the more important takeaway, uh, that even uh, that yes, sometimes people are motivated in their reasoning, but that doesn't mean that on average uh, it doesn't move people. Okay, so you, you know you might say this is interesting in, in the context of climate change, and so I wanted to investigate this issue um, in the context of uh, public health issue, vaccines. Of course, vaccines are a incredibly important issue as well as uh, interesting science communication uh, problem as well as a decision making problem. Coming back to this chart. Again, you see this difference between the public and scientist on, on whether or not vac uh, vaccines uh, um, are safe, particularly when we talk about childhood uh, vaccines. And there are, some, there are some, some positive things about the story on vaccines. Of course, they're one of the most effective public health interventions that we have. Immunization rates are currently high in the United States. That's good. Um, conservative estimates, when I was doing research on what the consensus among medical scientists is, uh, conservative estimates are about 90%. This actually includes prescriptive judgments about whether or not parents should be vaccinating their children from uh, scientists, which is a sort of a different form of consensus. So I expect that the descriptive consensus solely on whether or not they're safe is probably much higher than this. But I wanted to be conservative and, and, and use 90% in this case. But the people who've heard about the disadvantages of childhood vaccines has nearly doubled in the last uh, uh, decade and a half or so. Over 50% of Americans report being unsure about whether or not vaccines cause autism. And in a typical month, over 90% of US physicians, at least those uh, surveyed in a national uh, uh, board survey, frequently receive uh, requests to delay child vaccines, which, um, you know, at one point, this could be problematic. Uh, this is a very slippery slope when it comes to uh, public health. When people start, of course, we've seen the measles outbreak and, and other issues in the news recently uh, illustrating the, the importance of this. In terms of pro-vaccine communication, um, meta-analyses have largely been inconclusive about, about what works, especially among vaccine-hesitant audiences. And of course, one major issue is the so-called false media balance, right, where there's norm to sort of list all of the pros and cons in a, in, a, in a balanced fashion, which actually fails to communicate the level of scientific agreement that exists on this issue. All right? And one of my colleagues on this, Chris Clark, on this uh, uh, paper, He's done a lot of research on, on vaccines, and, and he similarly found that people's perception of, of, of what scientists think seems to attenuate uh, some factors in, in this context. So we teamed up on, on this particular study and, and investigated sort of the work that, that we've been doing in more detail. This was sort of an exploratory study on, on MTurk as well, where we had four conditions. The sort of classic descriptive norm condition that, that we've been using before, as well as a prescriptive norm. Uh, to some extent, from the social influence literature, we might expect that prescriptive norms are more influential when scientists say that you should be doing something or that you ought to be doing something, rather than just describing uh, agreement, as well as aligning them and sort of combining them uh, in a control condition. Here is an example. Uh, we use the same type of message, essentially. Um, that uh, This is the combination condition, and the other two, we, we split them out. And um, again, here we use people's perception of the medical consensus, uh, whether or not they think vaccines are, childhood vaccines are risky, whether they think there's a link uh, with autism. Uh, and a public support um, indicator that was really about whether or not people intend to vaccinate their children, or if they had children, would they do so? Would they support policies that force people to vaccinate their children? Um, some, of, some of these measures. So here's the results. Um, Agreement, perception of agreement was, was pretty high. It might be because it's an MTurk sample and people are slightly more educated and, and aware. But you see that people basically adjusted their perceptions to 90%. Uh, if we had used a higher number, it would probably be in line with the higher number. But I think the more interesting thing is here that there were significant effects on whether or not people endorsed the autism link. Almost, this was on a um, uh, five-point scale, almost one-point reduction 
for that question, um, similar to risk perception and, and public support. So in terms of effect sizes, the Cohen's D is right there. They're, they're quite decent for a single um, exposure. I should say that the descriptive, prescriptive, and combination conditions did not significantly uh, differ. The prescriptive ones seem to have the most uh, influential effect just descriptively, but again, we just combined them here because there, there didn't seem to be any separate, uh, separate effects. So a replicate of this gateway model that I talked about earlier here, and again, we find the same thing, that these main effects are mediated fully by whether or not people perceive normative agreement among medical scientists. And in this sense, the key belief is whether or not people think that vaccines cause autism. That and, and what people think the normative agreement is explains almost 40% in public support, which is, which is quite a lot. And you see that belief in the autism link by itself has a negative influence, of course, on, on public support. Um, but perceived agreement also has an important influence. And so if you were in one of the consensus, if you were exposed to consensus versus um, the control, uh, you significantly changed your perception of the level of agreement, which then had a direct effect on your support for vaccines, uh, but also an important indirect effect, about a third of the variance, through reducing your belief that vaccines cause, vaccines cause, cause autism. And part of that story is that previous research that has shown that vaccines communications are not effective tend to repeat this misinformation about the uh, vaccine autism link. And so here, uh, it's an interesting case where people change their beliefs uh, and people seem to take an implicit cue that if scientists agree that it's safe, it must mean that it doesn't cause um, autism, right? We, we never mentioned autism once in, in the uh, communication, at least, and, and it had an ability to, um, to change people's perception. Okay, so just wanted to end briefly some ideas of exploring consensus in the brain. Um, essentially, there is some, of course, uh, Emily Falk has done uh, a lot of research on, on, on social influence in, in this area. And a particularly interesting um, area of research is where social influence seems to trigger its feelings of rewards. In particular, it seems to implicate the ventral uh, striatum, uh, which is a subcortical structure of the brain, of the forebrain. I'm not sure if you can, uh, can see it there, but it's it basically central part of the reward uh, uh, system. It's a dopaminogenic pathway that activates uh, feelings of reward. And, and a few studies have shown that when people learn that they're in consensus with someone, or experts for that matter, it seems to activate um, that part of the brain. And so understanding the fundamental psychology of why people um, think consensus is, is so appealing and how it influences their behavior, I think is a key question. Uh, for me, uh, these are tools, so whether we use an agent-based model or a statistical model or, or a scan, these are tools to understand uh, larger questions about uh, consensus that I try to sort of draw together to, to answer these questions. So hopefully I've, I've shown you just a few things, that expert consensus condenses a complex amount of information for people into a simple normative fact that people seem to rely on in an important way, um, that it has the ability to reduce or depoliticize uh, some issues that we've talked about, Does it doesn't require repeating uh, a misinformation myth, and some robust replicated evidence that these findings at least uh, hold up in, uh, in the lab. And lastly, I'll say that, that thinking about macro level societal change, I think at the fundament of that is, is consensus about where we want society to go and what standards we, we want to set in terms of things that we find acceptable and not acceptable and sort of understanding that fundamental process of how consensus drives societal level change uh, is, is what I find exciting and I hope to convince you a little uh, that this is an interesting topic to pursue. I just wanted to briefly thank the funders and especially thank you for your time. Does anyone, uh, an estimate and reveal uh, uh, procedure? Star Wars one? Star Wars one? Jedi. Star Wars one? Jedi. Empire. The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, uh, yep. Followed closely by Return of the Jedi, but the difference was not statistically significant. Uh, uh, thank you.